You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome and welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Carver and I, Niels Kastelarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, um, I hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity enough to check out the back catalogue and listen to the past episodes that you may have missed, like my conversation with Alan last week where we discussed um, if there are strategies that can be used to diversify your trend-following allocations, such as shorter-term strategies, or if the cost of smoothing out returns this way is just simply too high in the long run. But also, if you missed our Wednesday episode, I would really encourage you to listen to this midweek conversation we had with Sean Hackett, which I think was one of the most interesting conversations of the year, not least because it's kind of outside my own area of expertise. And perhaps it could be one of the most important ones for people who believe in having commodities as part of their diversified portfolio. We know that weather can have massive impact on commodity markets, but in a period where inflation is already elevated, the coming weather volatility that Sean sees coming may well end up also having an effect on bond yields, on stock prices and currencies in the coming year. So, as mentioned, I would encourage you to go back and listen to these episodes when you're finished listening to Rob and me today. Rob, great to be back with you this week. So much continues to happen between our conversations. How are you doing? Yeah, it's it's quite good the listeners can't see the video feed because um, you're, you're sitting there in your T-shirt um, looking nice and toasty and wearing a baseball cap. Um, and I'm here wearing about 17 layers and a very warm fleecy hat because it's minus four here. And my, my wooden recording studio, unlike yours, is not very well insulated. So, uh, the, But it's sunny, which is nice. Um, but it is, you know, and obviously people uh, from Scandinavia and Switzerland will say that minus four is is summer but uh for, for us kind of feeble brits this you know this sudden plunge in temperatures has been a bit of a shock i think it's fair to say so that along with all the strikes we're having you know we're it, trying to keep upbeat going into christmas but uh the weather and the strikes aren't making it easy i think you're doing a good job and uh and also i think people appreciate now the length that you go to in order to have these conversations. So I'm sure we'll find some topics to warm up your uh, your inner self, so to speak, uh, that we can really uh, get into. But speaking of this thing about the coldness, yes, I am Scandinavian, and yes, I do live in Switzerland. But I will say there is a difference between minus four in Denmark and minus four in Switzerland is not the same. It's significantly colder uh, in, in Denmark because the the, the weather is just more wet and usually also a little bit more windy. So, um, yeah, it's not um, it's not as easy to compare these things. Yeah, Anyways. It's, it's the same it's the same here. It's minus four in the UK is definitely a lot a lot colder than minus four in, if, if I'm, say, skiing in Austria or something in the mountains, which is much yeah. crisper. But anyway, this is not a weather podcast, so we should it move isn't. on. No, no, absolutely. Anyways, December is a tricky time for the capital markets as well. We have banks, brokers, and investors all trying to close out the year with their respective portfolios 100% invested, carrying over cash uh, over the turn, so to speak. That's the year end that's also referred to as the turn. is not acceptable in many capital markets, and as a result, markets can become volatile to the point of seemingly irrational. And this year, we're seeing this play out in the Treasury bill market, for example, if you look at the soon-to-mature December 15th Treasury bill, uh, we see that it yielded 3.15% at the close of November, but it ended the day yesterday yielding only 2.39%. Now, logically, that makes no sense. The overnight Fed funds rate window is 375 to 4%, and the Fed uh, Reserve uh, repo program offers 3.8% uh, for institutional investors who qualify for that. And yet the near-term bill curve continues to be in disarray as we approach the year end. So how can this be the case? Well, it turns out that between December 6th and December 13th, the Treasury is paying down $76 billion in bills. And that's to say that, the, that they sold $76 billion fewer bills 
than the amount maturing. In effect, the Treasury tipped the supply demand of Treasury bills out of balance, which has resulted in this wild gyration in the build market. Now, also talking about gyrations, Friday morning, producer prices came out and will likely be a disappointment to the Fed as the month-over-month inflation measures came in above expectations despite the year-over-year measure tricking lower. Traders reacted uh, to this by selling into the close of the week with a 30-year bond trading back above 3.55% as we closed uh, off Friday. The volatility is sure to continue into next week as we have the Consumer Price Index released on Tuesday, FOMC announcement, its rate decision on Wednesday, and the November retail sales report is released on Thursday. Now, the Fed is widely assumed to raise the overnight rate by 50 basis points, but the CPI and retail sales are sure to influence their decision-making in the new year and will therefore be closely watched. By the way, before I close out, in other news, I thought it was interesting that investors, they cashed out $26.66 billion of domestic U.S. equity mutual funds and exchange-traded funds over the last seven days through Wednesday, according to Libra Funds, and uh, that is the biggest one-week outflow since April of 2021. And another piece of news I thought was quite interesting, and that is that Blackstone will limit investor redemptions from its $69 billion Blackstone Real Estate Income Trust in December after being hit with heavy withdrawals in October and November. That doesn't sound so great, in my opinion. Anyway, let's talk about what has been standing out to you, Rob, since we last had you on the Systematic Investor Series, I know we really just recorded something a few days ago, but that is a secret so far. It's in the vault, but it's not been released. Yeah, I think it's been about a month since I've been on the show properly. So just looking at one month, uh, one month performance for me personally has been sort of down a little bit. So um, I think I'm down something like, um, say, um, four or five percent, something like that. So not a great month, to be honest. Um Losses coming in fixed income US 20 years, I can see there, also in crude oil. Um, there's been a bit of a reversal in the bull, bullish kind of energy trade that we saw, well, particularly at the start of the year, but also over the year generally. Um, so the other the other thing I can do is look at the, the movements in all the markets I track, not just the ones I trade, uh, and adjust that by, by risk to get a kind of idea of how significant the moves are. Uh, and if I, if I look at that, then, for example... Um, the gasoline contract over the last month is down about 18%. Um, heating oil is down about 17%. So those sound like big moves, but they're moves of about one and a half standard deviation. So, you know, the, the market's moved against, but not, not massively. Heating oil also down about 17%. Um, markets that have done well over the last month, um, most of which sadly I don't have a position in, but anyway, let's list them out. So, a Eurocad is up a couple of standard deviations. That's pretty, pretty high. Um, there's been some rebound in some equity markets. So obviously in China, there's been a very interesting political situation with the, the, the riots going on there. So that's a very volatile market. But at least over the last month, the eight shares are actually up. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Taking a longer view, I mean, it's pretty much the end of the year now, right? So I think it's kind of okay to sort of think about year-end P&L. Um, there's only a few weeks left. Um, so, so far for the year, um, I'm up just a tiny touch under 20%. So, um, you know, the pattern of that performance is basically over the first few months of the year, obviously made a lot of money, um, as you know, from trend following, as pretty much everybody did. Uh, then there was a few, few fallow months, um, then made some more money in the summer, August and September were very good. Hit a new high watermark in September. Um, and then since then, things have kind of tailed off. So I'm, I'm down roughly um, sort of 12% and sort of roughly a 12% drawdown at the moment. So from a kind of peak return of about just over 30% in September, I'm now sort of looking at about 20%, which is, you know, is is better than, well, pretty much every long early asset class. So on a relative basis, obviously great. Um, it's not as good as 2019 was for me. Um but it's better than, you know, you know, and it's not as good quite. It's about the same as, say, 2015. So that just gives you an idea of, of where that return sits in kind of the pack. Um, doing the same exercise, so looking at the whole year now and looking at risk, risk adjusted returns across the whole whole series of markets. Um, so if I, if, I was, sorry, if I was to look, for example, just at returns, not at risk adjusted returns, it would be perhaps no surprise that the worst markets were Ethereum and Bitcoin, which were down over 60%. 
Um, but because those markets are so volatile, again, that doesn't really show up in the in the risk adjusted numbers. Looking at the risk adjusted numbers, uh, US two year was down over four vols, um, four standard deviations. Euribor as well, SHAT. So all you know, all fixed income markets and all fixed income markets that have a relatively short duration as well. So the, the front end of the curve, obviously, you know, when rates policy is is in a tightening environment at the front of the curve tends to get hurt more and the, the yield curve tends to flatten there you go there's some fixed income theory for you um or I, perhaps more accurately fixed income empirical results um and then on the long side interestingly so the kind of um energy markets that would were dominating things earlier in the year are no longer appearing in that those sort of top top markets of the year at least in vol adjusted terms so interestingly um the, the best market in my the ones I track is Swiss yen, which I don't trade and I guess would only be useful if, if you, Niels, want to go to Tokyo anytime soon. But um, you might be interested to know that's moved up three and a half standard deviations. Uh, and bizarrely, for me at least, but at least over the, the year to date period, the, the Russian ruble um, has done very well as well, which obviously is extremely counterintuitive. Um, and you can argue about whether the, I mean, this is the future I'm talking about. So it's it's a market that's kind of trading but not necessarily attached to the underlying in any meaningful way because the the underlying spot spot ruble is is effectively embargoed and very hard to trade but for what it's worth the future has done very well so uh, it's been an it's been an interesting year but but not the kind of very clear story of the first half of the year where it was all about the energy markets um if there is any clear story this year for me it's the fact that fixed income has done particularly badly um, just looking at those list of markets. Um, but otherwise, you know, we had some very clear trends at the start of the year. And since then, things have definitely been a bit more muddled. Yeah, when you say if fixing has done particularly badly, do you mean that the markets have done badly or that your performance in... I mean, I mean, the markets have done badly. So if I look, if I now turn to my own performance in the year to date, um, let's let's quickly do that, uh, just just for, for, for clarity's sake. So yeah, so looking at the the PNL um, from kind of worst to best, interestingly, gas, natural gas, has been one of my worst markets, um, and so that you know that's in, which is kind of interesting. I guess it's been very volatile um, and not not in a good way. You know, it's a very choppy. Um, then there's a bunch of equity markets. Um, some some I didn't do very well in some FX markets. I didn't do very well in. So quite a mixed bag on on the short side. Let let's have a look at the the, the biggest profits. So my biggest profit actually was that is still in energy markets. So gas is a kind of an anomaly. So um, I made a lot of money in things like heating oil, gasoline, Brent, and that would all have been in the first few months of the year, and then kind of holding steady since then. Um, done well in currencies, Brazilian real, euro, yen. They're all up there. Um, corns up there and US 20 is up there so actually one of my best markets was actually fixed income market so being short that fixed income market was obviously a good trade um, I can see Korean 10 year there is there as well um, so actually you know interestingly um, th- again thematically in terms of where I've done well and where I haven't done so well there's n- a part long energy that you know the long energy trade is the only real clear standout signal there um and even then as i said there's an energy market ga- um, gas um henry hub gas specifically where i didn't do so well so that's kind of interesting so where are we in t- um in terms of the the current current situation in terms of my positioning going into the end of the year so risk is very low which is kind of what i'd expect in a, in a drawdown when trends are not not so clear as they have been perhaps um, so my biggest long positions, interestingly, are in soy, uh, both soy meal and soy oil. Um, I'm actually now currently short US gas, so we'll see how that plays out. I'm also short VIX, which is effectively a risk on trade. Uh, so that that's kind of interesting. But none of those positions are particularly big. So my, my kind of risk is running at maybe a third or even a quarter of my kind of long run risk target. So uh, it's very much a question of kind of keeping... Um, kind of metaphorically my cards close to the chest my chest and not putting too many chips on the on the table at the moment and just waiting to see uh, what plays out in in the new year were you happy with the way your um dynamic market selection i can't remember what you call it uh um, dynamic optimization but dynam- dynamic, dynamic optimization. market selection is actually probably a better name for it because it actually describes exactly okay. what it does but yeah right so were you happy with the way that all panned out i can't remember when you implemented it but 
obviously what essentially for people who may not know what we're talking about, you're trying to put, you know, have a, a bigger universe of markets that you effectively can trade and then optimize for selection of those markets that would essentially replicate the optimal portfolio best. Um, yeah, so um, this is actually quite an interesting discussion because it's quite hard to um, objectively measure the kind of benefit that this strategy has. Because you say, well, what, what am I going to compare it against? Okay. Um, should I compare it against the 100, 100 plus markets I could trade if I had sufficient capital? Well, it, on that basis, it would have underperformed on in expectation. It might have outperformed over the last year, which is roughly how long I've been running it. But over the entire back test, it will underperform because it just obviously can't do as good a job. Um, but the underperformance isn't big. It's about 20 percent of sharp, which is you know still leaves me with a huge improvement over what I had before. So I'm happy with that. Um, so w you should compare it against. Um, the alternative, which is a static selection of a number of markets. Now, the issue with doing that is that in that static selection process, you might by luck pick uh, markets that are done particularly well on average. So let's take a, an, an example. So um, my best performing market over the last 12 months in, is Brazilian real US dollar. Okay. Um, now, let's suppose at the start of the year, I'd only been able to choose one market to trade in my portfolio as my alternative to dynamic optimization. Now, this is obviously an extreme example, but let, let's just suppose suppose that. Now, it, after a year, if I'd done looked at my performance over the last year, which, well, not, not quite one year, but year to date is about 20%. If I'd just been trading Brazilian real, I might have made 40%. From that, should I conclude that my dynamic optimization is a complete waste of time? Of course not. I've just been really lucky with my choice of market. Um, now, I am going to... Um, uh, in, in April, because April's when I normally do my kind of very thorough PL risk calculation. I normally do a blog post about it as well, because it's the end of the UK tax year. For anyone wondering why April, which seems very arbitrary. And it's April the 6th as well, the start of the tax year. It's very arbitrary. It's not even April the 1st. There's no logic to it at all. And, you know, you have to go back well, to. April the 1st would be a bad day to choose. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Fools, wouldn't like, it? It would yeah. really be a bad day. But anyway. Um, but one thing I'm going to do then is is to actually look at compare my system as it was before I started training done on capitalization, which would be a fixed set of about thirty markets to see how well that's done. With the caveat that you know I'm that those thirty markets may by luck have been really have done really really well. Um, so that that's the issue. So it's for, so it's very hard to say you know except by looking at long periods of history and by adjusting for this effect of luck, which is obviously an exercise I've done. Um, to say whether it's behaved as I expect. But, you know, in terms of general behaviour, because I think it's one thing that I like to say to people is doing a back test isn't just so you can identify which is the best trading strategy to trade. This is a, a common misconception. And actually, a back test is often the worst way of doing that because it can lead you down the path of overfitting, right? Which, are, you know, those of us who do this for a living know all about, right, from personal experience. Um, but another good way, a good thing to do a back test for is to give you an idea of the likely behaviour of a trading system. Um, and by, by behaviour, I mean things like holding period, number of times you trade per day, trading costs you incur, typical leverage values, typical numbers of positions you take, blah, 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 blah. You can measure all kinds of metrics. And then when you actually start trading, you can compare what you're actually achieving against those. Uh, and if, if you've got the, the tools to do that, you can do this statistically. So you can say, is this outside of what I'd expect for the distribution of this over a year? I mean, you can do that with PL as well. So you can say, OK, I've lost 20% this year. Is that unexpected? Or, you know, should I shut my system down? Have I done something massively wrong? Has the market condition to change dramatically? Or is that just roughly what I'd expect looking at the back test? So you can do it with PL as well, but you can go beyond that. Um, so if I if I look at the behaviour of the system in terms of the numbers of trades it's done, holding period, costs, all of these things, um, then I find that's well within my expectations. So, in t you know, has it behaved as I expected? Yes. Um, but if you're asking that in the very narrow sense of, is it better than what I did before? The answer is, well, frankly, you know, a, 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 you can't really tell that just by doing a straight year, year by year comparison of, of, of P&L. No, I completely agree. And it's interesting because, um, you know, 
when you explain how kind of your year panned out um, and you're doing it in one specific way, when I look across the industry, when I look at kind of how the year panned out for us or is panning out for us and so on and so forth, I mean, we all do things slightly differently, but broadly speaking, trend following this year has had kind of the same um, pattern. Um, most managers probably made their last new high uh, around September, end of September, um, and have had a little bit of give back, um, maybe maybe October, but thereabouts. So, yeah, no, it's been an interesting year. But just maybe to finish off on the, on the trend following update as, as we normally do. I mean, I think this week uh, was pretty uneventful from a PNL point of view. Um, as 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 Rob already mentioned, I mean, energy bulls were put under some pressure yet again. Um, long-term trend follows may still be long, uh, the energy sector, but of course some other systems will um, be short at this time, who, who knows. I think currencies, I would say probably mixed, although there were some big moves um, in uh, in things like Mexican peso. I don't follow the real, but Mexican peso certainly had a big move. And then of course, with the higher PPI coming in, um, we did see a little bit of uh, help to those uh, who are still short uh, in the fixed income space. Um, and then uh, I think uh, soft and grains with the moves they had uh, probably did okay. Uh, maybe with the exception of soybean oil, I think that uh, went a little bit uh, the other way this week. Um, and uh, yeah, metals, equities, again, depending on time frame, how it did. What's interesting to me also is that the trend barometer that I publish every day, that's been moving up now. I think the low was like 23, which was really confirming the poor, poor month of of um, November, but it's been moving up and it finished at 48. So now we're back into kind of neutral territory. So are we going to see an improvement into the last uh, couple of weeks of um, of the year? Could be. Um, that would, of course, be be good news. Uh, year to date and month to date for the indices, we track beta 50 down about a percent for the month, uh, up 13.1 uh, for the year. Uh, Stock Gen CTA index um, is down 1.3% for the month, uh, up 18.6 for the year. Shocked in trend down one and three quarters, up 25 and a half for the year. And the short-term traders index uh, flat for the month, up 11 and a half for the year. And that is as of Thursday. And Friday was definitely a good day. So the numbers are probably a little bit better. All right, let's move on to some questions that came in always with uh, when Rob is on. There's so many questions, which is great. We appreciate it. And... Um, the first one that came in is from Eli. Eli writes, uh, hi, Nils. Hope all is well. As always, I'm enjoying the weekly podcast and looking forward to Rob's show this coming week. A few questions for Rob. I'm in the process of testing Rob's continuous trend systems. Um, it seems that daily vol targeting is an inherent feature of a continuous system. Since the system doesn't look at the market in trades, meaning it doesn't look on a trade-by-trade -trade basis per se, but instead calculates the appropriate position each day. Is there any way to run a continu continuous system without daily vol targeting, for example, only calculating vol when the signal change signs? So I'm going to stop with that because there's like a three or four questions in total. Yeah, so there's basically two main components to my system that make it different from a kind of classic can I say classic trend following system, traditional, you know, whatever words people who use these systems like to use. Um, so um, basically, I'm continuously adjusting my opinion on two things. Firstly, what I call my forecast, which is effectively my expected risk adjusted return. And in a trend following system, that's purely the strength of the trend. OK, so when you when I initially go into a trend, I'll have quite a small position because the trend will have not been going for very long. Um, or the market will be coming out of a choppy period and the trend's only just really making itself evident. When a trend's been going for a long time, then the position will be bigger because um, if you actually look at the um, relationship between trend strength and future return, generally speaking, with some caveats, and you'll need to read my new book to find out what they are, but generally speaking, um, the stronger the trend is, the, the, the higher the return you expect in the future, and therefore the bigger your position have. So I'm constantly changing my opinion on the, the strength of the trend, effectively. The other thing I'm constantly changing my opinion on is the size my position should be relative to current volatility. Okay, So the, 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 if you think about a 
sort of very simple static system, what you'd basically do is on day one open a trade. At that point, you've got some opinion about the strength of the trend. Um, and effectively, all you, you treat or probably treat all trends as equal. Okay. There are other ways of doing it, but but generally speaking, you'll let's say you've got something simple like a moving average crossover. The moment that you know short crossover moves over the slower one, you say, right, now I'm going to be long one unit of risk. Okay. And then whatever happens to the to the trend trade after that, I'm staying long one unit of risk until you get closed out either by the crossover reversing or a stop loss being hit. Also at that point you'd calculate the size of position you need depending on the current level of volatility. Okay. So if volatility is low, you'd have a bigger position and vice versa. And because you're holding that position constant throughout the life of the trade, um, you're effectively ignoring any changes in volatility that happen. Okay, so that's the the way that a lot of people do it. The way I do it is to continuously evaluate those two things: strength of trend, strength of volatility, uh, level of volatility, and adjust my position size accordingly. I say continuously, but it's effectively on a daily basis. Um, now, what um, Eli's saying is, well, what happens if you take out one of those components? In the words, you you take out the the fact that you're adjusting for the strength of volatility throughout the life of the trade but effectively keeping the other component in there right so you'll still be trading every day as the strength trade strength of trend increases but you won't be adjusting the size of your volatility now if i look at the the improvement in return i get from a static to system to the system where i'm looking at both these variables every day very roughly, very roughly, about about a third of the improvement I get comes from the fact that I'm changing my trend forecast every day, and about two thirds comes from the volatility adjustment. So volatility adjustment is actually more beneficial to me than adjusting the forecast for trend strength. So doing what Eli suggests, so of course you can do it. Of course you can do it. Absolutely, you could do it. You could put a trade on and be adjusting that continuously depending on the strength of trend, but ignoring changes in volatility, but you'll lose roughly two-thirds of the benefit from, from doing that. Um, it's also a bit of a perverse thing to do because one huge advantage of the simple system where you just go long, you know, five contracts, hold a position, hit a stop-loss close, that's a much simpler system to run than mine, okay? You can run it much more easily manually on spreadsheets and so on and so forth. Um, now, doing what Eli suggests, which is this hybrid, hybrid kind of halfway house system, um, you know, actually involves pretty much as much work because you're still going to re-estimate the strength of the trend. It's not really a lot of extra work then to estimate the change of volatility as well. So it's possible, but it will not be as good, and it seems like a bit of a strange thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I will say that um, this is, of course, also because you've chosen moving average crossover. I think a lot of the quote unquote, early um, trend followers. I mean, obviously the earliest trend following that I'm aware of is actually volatility breakout. Price breakout came about 10 years later in the 80s, uh, of course, with the turtles. Um, but vol breakout is how I think both Keith Campbell, uh, Dunn, of course, uh, and some of the other uh, guys from the 70s. Uh, so I, I, so I wonder a little bit. So certainly I can see that if you were using breakout systems, I can certainly see. And if you took the static route, which is perfectly fine, then certainly you cut down on the maintenance work. There's very little to do other than, you know, do your trades for a new signal, uh, so to speak. Um but I take your point that it might be different if you're using moving average crossover. Well, that's the the issue is more the fact that it's really it's quite hard to construct a breakout breakout system that produces a continuous forecast. I, I mean, I've actually done it, but it, it's not what move, I call it breakout. It's not most because breakouts are very much a binary on off thing, right? Whereas a moving well, average, you would need a lot. You would need a lot of parameter combinations in that system to do it as. I mean, this is partly what we do uh, on our side. So I'm pretty familiar with it so you can do it but you're Niels, right are you revealing the secret source not really but <laughs> there we are well i'm going to put that on twitter anyway Niels finally spills the secret source listen to this episode <laughs> good stuff um all right well that's just the first question that eli's had um then he goes on to say rob calculate signal scaling based on average cross across many futures contracts can this be done with in-sample data due to the vast amount of data being used? 
Okay, so what Eli's talking about here is that um, basically in my system, because I'm combining different forecasts together and because also the way my position sizing works, all my um, trading rules are constructed in such a way that they have a consistent um, scaling. Okay, so in my in my world, um, zero means flat, plus 10 means an average size long position, plus 20 means a position that's twice as big as that, and I don't actually go above plus 20. Minus 10 means an average size short position, minus 20 is twice as big as that. And then obviously in between that, you'd have a continuous, you'd have plus 3.6 or minus 20. 19.2 or something um, now of course the issue is how do you for the remain you know, i use many different trading rules and almost none of them um, automatically produce a number that's in that scaling that has that meaning um, so what i i do is i, I look at the um the historic data um and i um basically measure the 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 kind of natural scaling of something some trading rule, just think of it as a black box that produces a number. So all I do is I look at the distribution of those numbers and I say, okay, what number, what scaling factor should I use to translate that? It's just a linear factor, just a multiplier from, you know, the numbers that are coming out of the black box into this nice plus, minus 20 to plus 20 scaling. Um, now that um, can be done in various different ways. Um, in my, in my back test, I do it on a rolling basis looking only at historical data so there's no forward looking thing going on there but actually because this number is um, relatively stable and um, because it's not really adding any alpha to the system there's not really a lot of harm in doing it in sample as Eli says to be honest um, because it, it's not you know it's not you're, you're kind of cheating in a way because you're using forward looking data because it's in sample but in practice you know it's it's fine because you know you can use almost the, the slower your tr your system is, the more data you need to get a kind of reliable figure. Um, but you don't need much data generally to get a number, and that you can almost use the same number all the way through your your back test. Uh, and actually, for a lot of um, trading rules I use, you can actually derive these numbers either using artificial data or even analytically. In other words, you can literally, if if you know how to do things like um, sort of familiar with a kind of option pricing theory literature side of things you can do things like say well if i assume that prices follow some process i can actually calculate um you know with a pen and paper what the scaling factor should be um and you find nice results like for example with moving averages if you double the length of the moving average the scaling act factor changes by the square root of two which you should you'd, you'd kind of expect um if you're familiar with the sort of mathematical financial mathematical theory um so it's one of those things i say to people you know don't I, I do it the proper way, you know, backward looking, always out of sample. But in practice, it's one of these things that makes almost no difference. So don't don't lose sleep over it. All right, cool. All right, now we move to the dark side because the next question is, Rob has mentioned a mean reversion system with a high sharp. Is there anywhere to find out more about this or do we have to wait for Rob's new book? I mean... I mean, Eli obviously already knows the answer yeah. to this question, right? <laughs> uh, I will say that, that in the book I, it does have a high sharp it's got sharp over two um, and I do say in the book um, I never trust anything with a sharp over two this is no exception just because I've you know I've built it doesn't mean you should trust it um, um, it's probably still got a positive sharp but I doubt it's as high as that and there, there are all kinds of caveats for trading mean reversion systems so you know don't Eli don't think you're going to buy my book and this is going to be this guaranteed sharp ratio to thing because you should know know by now that that's not the kind of thing that I do so right absolutely well I mean um, Eli continues down the dark side because he then goes on to say can join can not can join can Rob join the podcast more frequently I think that for individual investors trying to design a system, he's an especially important co-host. Perhaps you can start a series with him, a series two. Now, Eli, you clearly don't know, or maybe you've forgotten how long holidays Rob takes every year. <laughs> so having him on more frequently on the podcast is really going to be tough. But I do appreciate the comment. And of course, Rob is an important um contributor to all these discussions so, I, so anyways thank yeah i appreciate yeah, the ahead. comment as well but i i should point out that this is not like you know one member of my family this eli person so 
you know. Well, kind <laughs> just, of say one, that. One question, one question about my new book and another question saying I'm, I'm the best co-host on the podcast. People may yeah, be suspicious. Didn't use the word best. Let's well, just say right, that's okay. be clear. Okay. Right. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, fair Thank enough. you, Eli. All right. Much appreciated. Okay. Moving on to uh, another question from Matthews, who's written in before. So nice to uh, see you again here. Um, Thanks again for a wonderful podcast, for your your team is making. I really enjoy working my way through the entire back catalog. Great to hear. On a one inch issue that frequently comes up in the context of trend following is that while it has a tendency to perform quite well during slow equity and bond sell-offs, it doesn't offer as much protection slash diversification in quick sell-offs. To protect against that sort of shock to your portfolio, people often seem to look towards option strategies for tail protection and other alternatives. I was wondering if you or Rob could share how you think about the role of such tail protection in your portfolio. If one has a portfolio of, say, one-third buy and hold stocks, one-third buy and hold bonds, one-third multiple asset class trend following, all scale to the same vol. How important is it to add trail, tail protection to this mix? Presumably, it becomes more important if you scale things to higher vol. Is the drag from the tail protection um, more than paid for um, by the higher vol? You can run the rest of your portfolio at? Question mark. Finally, is there any easy way to access such tail protection either through a DIY solution or some external manager. Thanks for considering the question. Thanks, Matthews, for this. Um, it's kind of funny because um, we kind of have that coming up in the uh, year-end uh, conversation, I would say. Yeah, but- we do. We, we talk about a couple of papers, um, one from a Tail Protect Fund, which has a certain slant, and one from AQR, which is, in my opinion, a better paper and and um, kind of agrees with your point that basically the faster the sell-off, the more likely it is that a tail protection fund, and, and for those who aren't familiar, a very simple tail protection strategy would just be continuously buying out of the money put options on, the, on, on equities or some proxy for your portfolio. So it's a strategy that, that basically has a, most of the time, has a negative return, but has a high positive return in a, in a market downturn. Um, so that's obviously a very pure way of buying insurance on your portfolio because it's pretty much guaranteed to pay out. Whereas, of course, trend following is something that empirically has done okay in sell-offs. But, you know, we can point to sell-offs, sharp sell-offs like COVID 2020 most recently, where it hasn't done as well um, and where a, a tail protection fund would potentially do better. So um, now, is it important to add tail protection to a mix? Should you run things at higher volume? Questions like these. Um, now... Um, this is one of those things where it's not really, I can't really give you a theoretical answer. It's going to depend really highly on the character of the tail protection fund involved. Um, So um, if you just do something really simple, like selling out of the money puts, that strategy does so badly um, most of the time. um, Did you mean buying? Sorry, buying out of the money puts, of course. Right. You know, it's been a long time since I've traded options, Niels and I. Has, I <laughs> no, I was just wanting to I'm make sure we're not giving people the, the cold. The cold. <laughs> Everyone's going to go here. Yeah. <laughs> buying out of the money puts definitely that. Um, yeah. So if you if you do that's you know if you just do that naive strategy, then um, you're probably not going to get any benefit from adding that to your portfolio in any size because its performance is just so poor. Um, that um, you know, on the, the odd times when it will obviously gain you extra money, um, the the perhaps the only exception would be if you were currently running your portfolio at a very high leverage, um, and where that particular strategy would um, then mean you actually were able to preserve capital in a downturn that would otherwise wipe you out. So if you are, if you are running your portfolio at such a high leverage that say a, I don't know a twenty percent downturn in in the S and P would completely wipe you out then yes, adding tail protection to that, even a poor tail protection strategy would make you money, but you shouldn't be running your portfolio with that kind of leverage anyway, because that's that's insane. Um, So, um, you know, I'd say um, for a good tail protection fund, and and Niels has obviously interviewed tail protection managers, and um, and I think he could probably answer the second part of the question better, which is how do you get the tail protection? But in, well, what? Yeah, yeah. Ahead. Let me just finish, and then you can come onto that. So, in the abstract sense, if I can buy a tail protection fund that's not costing me too much money in premiums, because it's not just naively buying out of the money, op- um, you know, put options. It's 
doing something smarter um, and you know and selectively buying or, or using some kind of indicator to indicate when it's when the vol is relatively cheap or relatively high or perhaps even dynamically switching between um, a, a buying actual options and buying synthetic options like through a fast trend following strategy so there are all kinds of ways to juice up your tail protect fund and make it cleverer um, then yes you will potentially there will be then be a value for adding tail protection into your into your overall fund um, I would just caution <laughs> though about then saying oh this is great I can now pull the leverage lever you know whack up my leverage because I'll be protected from a, a market downturn you're not but unlike the very simple tail protection strategy um, where you're continuously buying put options and you're definitely going to be protected from a market downturn assuming you know that the counterparty risk isn't a problem um, then, then you know, then you know, any situation where the tail protection is not perfect, which is true of trend following, but a, you know, a good a good tail protection fund that isn't costing you as much money in premiums, you're going to be giving something up, and what you're giving up is that certainty of a payoff in the event of a of a tail event, um, and that means you should not then necessarily say, oh, great, I can go and get loads more leverage now. Absolutely not. I think that would be, you know, a very silly thing to do. Um, but yeah, over to you, Niels. Well, first of all, I wanted to say uh, that obviously Mathis is kind of right in saying that usually, um, you know, trend followers, we do better when there's a kind of a slower sell-off. I mean, clearly, if something changes from a peak uh, in equities, for example, where like in February of um, 2018, uh, yeah, trend followers will have a, a problem because we're going to get caught usually in every single sector. Uh, on the wrong side. However, I would say actually that in COVID, with during COVID, I think we did quite well. I mean, certainly on our, at our fund, we were up in March pretty strong, and had the crisis continued, we would have been absolutely correctly positioned for that crisis. It just didn't materialize. I think also with tail protection funds, and I'm not an expert, I'll, I'll proclaim that for sure, is that you know, a lot of the money that was reported as being made during COVID, yeah, a lot of it had also to do when they were basically monetizing these options. Uh, did they do it at the right time? Or a week later, they would probably not have made that much money if, if and so on and so forth. So I think there's lots of things to consider. And of course, then you have a year like this year where everybody was hoping that their tail protection funds would be working. And it's just been the complete reverse. And in fact, we've seen some of the most well-known long ball managers um, basically close their shop. So what I will say instead, Matt, is, is that two things. You should go back to the 12th of January of this year and listen to the conversation that Harry had with David Dave Dredge. They are, that's a great conversation. And then you're going to look forward to a conversation I recorded yesterday where we had Dave back, but this time with Jem. So again, two vol experts talking shop here and me trying to keep up. Um, that was a fascinating conversation, not necessarily specifically on your question, but on vol and on what's been going on in that space um, this year and, uh, and so on and so forth. But great question um, and we appreciate that. All right, comment from... Um, Richard and and a couple of questions. Um, well, I have more more questions. Uh, can't another family member? It seems like can't wait for your new book, Rob. I have two questions about carry. Question one: In the original carry paper, the authors described how the carry strategy works in all asset classes, but that the mechanics is varied. In equities, global bonds, and credit, carry predicts future price appreciation. In currencies, future prices are independent of carry. In commodities and options, the market takes back part of the carry. Have you considered conditioning your carry forecast based on asset class? First question. Um, okay, so I'm just actually quickly pulling up my own um, asset class by asset class figures uh, just to kind of give people a flavor for... Um, so when they say gives back carry, what they mean is... The thing about carry is it's quite a nice uh, trading rule because you can actually work out how much money you expect to make very directly because it you know it's a thing you, so you think about spot effects as a simple example of a carry strategy um you know if one currency is yielding three percent more than another then your expectation is you'll make three percent a year or whatever leverage you've got so it's you can actually calculate the number um whereas for something like trend following you you need to do like a regression on realized versus ex you know expected trend strength something like that like i was talking about earlier uh, to give you that figure it's much more imprecise um so 
the the issue is of course that trend all you know most a lot of trading strategies don't necessarily do equally well on all asset classes so for example equity indices don't seem to be as good with trend following particularly fast trend following as other asset classes which is kind of interesting uh the same is true of carry as well um so actually um the the way that i have this this thing i in, in my book i call um percentage of carry realized which is so effectively if you think about the simple example where you expect to earn three percent a year if carry realized is 50 percent, that means you're only earning one and a half percent a year if carry realized is 200 percent, that means you're you're, you're earning six percent a year so you're carries actually not just telling you how much you earn from carry but it's actually saying well this also means the spot price is going to appreciate as well and you'll make some extra money so on average, carry realised for me is 115% across all asset classes. In other words, carry delivers the 3% I expect plus a bit extra on average. Um, but the, the the authors of this very seminal paper on carry found that was not true necessarily of all asset classes. Um, so interestingly, um, carry seems to work best in financials. So equities, vol, bonds... In FX, you get about the same amount of carry as you, you want to get. It's about 109% there. Uh, it does pretty well in metals, um, but it doesn't do as well in energy and ags where you only get 77% and 46% respectively. So the market takes back some of the carry, but carry is still a profitable strategy, if you like. So if you think about ags, it's about 50%. So if the, the carry is telling you you're going to earn about 3% a year. In practice, you make one and a half, which is still positive. It's still good, which is nice. Um, but it's not 100% of what you expect, and that, that's also the finding in the academic paper. Now, the question is, what should one do about this? Should one then say, well, actually, I'm going to trade less carry in, in, say, ags markets like corn and wheat uh, or soy, and more carry in financial markets like you know, S&P or VIX or whatever? Um, now, I'm always very reluctant, as, as we've discussed the podcast before, to um, make, make these kinds of things where I, I start singling out individual instruments or groups of instruments like asset classes are saying I'm going to trade these differently from how I trade everything else because statistically the evidence really is not there so although it may seem like this is a very striking finding that if I compare say I don't know ags which is running at about 50% realized carry versus equities that's running at over 150% so three it looks like it's three times better if you actually look at the statistical significance of the numbers it's pretty weak um, so I'm, I'm just very wary of overfitting and so on and so forth. Um, the benefit I could get to my system from from doing that, from putting you know more carry in equities and less carry in ags, would be you know in the order of a few basis points of sharp. So my sharp on my whole strategy might go from like one to one point oh five. To me, that's not enough of an improvement to to risk potentially overfitting. So I, I personally would not do this. All right. Final question from Richard. He writes, to calculate the raw carry forecast for seasonal instruments, I use the spread of nearest contract to nearest plus 12 months. However, I'm aware that this gives a weaker forecast compared to the usual method of nearest versus next nearest. Should I scale up my forecast to account for this? Um, and if so, by how much? Um, so I, I, it's quite carry is um, one of these things where in some cases it's quite hard to estimate what it should be. Um, so obviously the seasonality there's also weird things going on for example in the the, the German 10 year bund market and a couple of other European bond markets um, there's actually a, a strong seasonal component there because of the the issuance cycle um, and you know so um, and then you even in equities you wouldn't expect seasonality in equities but actually particularly in Europe um, most companies pay semi-annual dividends and one dividend is much bigger than the other um, so you tend to see spikes in dividends, which affects carry as well. So carry is subject to this kind of seasonality issue. And, and uh, hopefully the last time I plug my book, but there's a, you know, there's a whole chapter in my book which goes on about, about this and different ways to get around this problem. Um, for this specific question, um, again, I, I would say I, I would be very reluctant to, um, to do this. So my attitude would be perhaps to say, well, some people would say, well, if you can't estimate carry accurately, then don't just don't trade carry on that instrument. I think that's fine if you're consistent with that. I'm, I'm less confident about saying, well, I'm going to cut my carry forecast in half because I'm not so sure about it. To me, again, this seems a little bit like, like overfitting potentially without really looking at hard empirical evidence, just, just, just based on a kind of slightly whimsical view about, about seasonality. But maybe I'm being harsh, but 
you know, my, my general view is do everything the same for every instrument unless there's very strong, compelling evidence, both statistically and also a good reason why I should do anything different. It makes life simpler, means you've got less chance of overfitting. All right, we're going to move on to, um, I think uh, maybe we just bring up this one, even though there were two things. One we forgot from last, not we didn't forget it, but from last time there was a paper um uh, you know what? What? What have we learned uh, since uh, since Jagadish and Tietman's paper came out thirty years ago? That article, but I think you brought up another one uh, today that I'm not personally familiar with. Uh, another uh, AQR paper. They seem to be, uh, you know, producing all these papers that we can talk about forever. Um, so, um, but that's about portfolio optimization, as far as I remember. Uh, mean variance optimization. So, you pick where you want to go. Um, yeah, let's well, let's briefly talk about the AQR paper um, um, on optimization. So, um, I like to think that there are a lot of people who listen to the podcast and want me on every week because I have the view of the retail investor. Um, but I'm hoping that there also there's a small community of nerds who are listening who are, who like me on because I, you know, I do occasionally like to talk about the really nerdy stuff. So, but this is for you, nerds. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm one of my, my kind of main, one of my main sort of academic interests is in, is in portfolio optimization, um, and, and how to do it robustly and so on and so forth. And I've done quite a lot of research writing on it. So I'm always very interested whenever anyone comes up with a, a new take on the subject. And this is particularly good because it, it's a, it's a paper by AQR, of course, who are generally very good and uh, specifically by, um, now I'm probably going to mispronounce this. So you want to correct me, but Lasse Peterson. Lasse Peterson. Okay, I would have got it correct. A Dane, of, of course. Dane, who's of Dane and an extremely good person who's got got a classic book on called Expected Returns, a more recent book actually, which um, I, I keep meaning to buy. So if anyone's listening, Christmas is coming. Um, on on uh, I think it's so it's about investing in drawdowns and like that. It's no doubt going to be very good because he's a he's a very good writer. And a very, very brilliant guy. But he's written this with a couple of co-authors, who I think are also at AQR, but I could be wrong. I think that's true. That's true. So these are all AQR people. Um, so um, it's very interesting for two reasons. Firstly, it's kind of um, using a, uh, a way to do portfolio optimization that deals with the problems of portfolio optimization, which are well known and that, that it produces extreme weights that small differences in the input can produce radically different weights um, but does so in, in a relatively simple way and I say relative because of course the average person will look at the equations in this paper and be like Rob really that's simple but but it is relatively simple um, and therefore it's very intuitive to understand what's going on and if, for those of you familiar it's kind of a take on the old uh, the Bayes Litterman Bayes um, Black Litt the Bayesian Black Litterman paper which is a you know, must be 25 years old now, uh, possibly older. Um, so it's coming, kind of going back to that and doing some some tweaks, which is nice. I like I like people using a robust methods that you can easily understand, rather than say some fancy machine learning algorithm, which is much less intuitive and probably less robust. Um, but relevant relevant to this podcast um, is is they what they then do is say, well, we're going to alter the the expected returns according to momentum. Okay, so basically the portfolio will overweight things that have had positive momentum and underweight things that have negative momentum. So, um, well, you know, the, the, there's basically, I, I think, as in, for me personally, there are two ways to use momentum in my, my investing and trading life, if you like. There's a very direct futures trading classic CTA type strategy that I run that I talk about on this podcast. Um, but most of you will know that I also have a long only investment portfolio, mainly of ETFs, but also some, with some individual shares. Um, and that's long only, but I can still use momentum there by, you know, weight, giving a higher weight to assets that have had positive momentum and a lower weight to assets that have had negative momentum. So the simplest way of thinking about that is purely the, the bond equity mix. So let's say that I average, I actually, my actual long term target is 80 20, not 60 40. Um, but I, 80 20, if equities have done particularly well relative to bonds, that could go to 90 10 and vice versa. And I do that in quite a sort of, um, fairly cat handed way a very 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 simple way um but the the nice thing about that paper is it has a similar kind of framework but a mu much better theoretical grounding so for for the nerds out there it's it's definitely worth reading um i, I have to confess i only skimmed through it briefly because it was it was sent to me on twitter by somebody yesterday so i've not had a lot of time to look at it um but it's if you're into this stuff it's definitely worth looking at 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, do you want to just then go straight to the trailer for the year-end uh, group conversation? You had a few thoughts and things. Well, you let's. Just should we talk about the Jagged Nation t- Tittman paper? Okay, because, yeah, we can. You know, yeah, I think let's it, do that. Yeah, please. let's do that because that's left over from last time. So remind me, was this something that someone had sent to us or something that had come? No, to I your think attention? this was one of your own topics actually. Okay. Um, and I think you found the article yeah. in Zero Hedge or maybe something like that. I don't. Oh. Um, Niels, and, wash your um, mouth out. I do not. I do not look at. Oh, Zero. Alpha, Hedge. Alpha Architect. <laughs> alpha Architect. Zero Arch- Hedge. Alpha Architect. Well, I don't know. I mean, you I'm, know. I'm wearing uh, a, a fleecy hat, not a tin hat. Zero Hedge is not oh, my sorry, natural yeah. home. Yeah, okay, so um, this is... Um, so Jagadish and Tipman, for those who are not familiar, was the original paper where academics looked at, at momentum. Although, of course, like a lot, with a lot of these things, the industry had been using it for for decades before that as we know so um but 1993 which is nearly 30 years ago which is terrifying thought um the the academics finally kind of caught up to the fact that that um you know it looks trend following works trend following works or to be pedantic time series momentum works which is not quite the same because it's it's a cross-sectional relative effect so okay so it's not about looking whether things have gone up and down independently it's about saying what's gone in a basket of stocks, what's gone up a lot, buy those, what's gone down a lot, sell those, and, and trading that factor portfolio. So it's very much in the spirit of the kind of farmer and French papers. These two things are linked, but they're not quite the same. Um, so um, th- this paper was written over 30 years ago. So what, what um, th- this new paper, um, which is um, now, again, you're going to have to correct my pronunciation, Tobias Weist, is it? Oh, I don't. I don't have it in front it's of me. It's W I E S T. Yeah, Vice. so it's, it's German, I guess. Um, yeah. Anyway, this paper's come out in Financial Markets and Portfolio Management, um, and uh, it's it's what you'd call a survey paper. So it looks at a lot of papers that have been written in the last thirty years and kind of reviews the evidence um, because obviously, you know, one thing that academics really worry about is that they find some effect. Everyone. And then it disappears. Why does it disappear? Well, there are two main reasons. One is that they data mined the effect. It wasn't really a robust finding to begin with. The other possibility um, is that everyone finds out about it and starts trading it, and then it goes away. Okay. So you know, a lot of a lot. Then there's been papers done, uh, and I think AQR might do one actually, where they look at a lot of these you know anomalies that people have found in the past, and one of those two things has happened to them, and they can and they sort of try and identify which is which. Um, but momentum's luckily for us, of course, not in that category. It has actually kept working, um, and um, there's some there's some interesting stuff in there that's perhaps a bit more nerdy about the explanation for momentum. Um, is it behavioural? Is it risk based? You know, a lot of practitioners maybe don't care about that. <laughs> They're just happy that it exists, um, and maybe that's the right attitude. I, I personally, from an academic perspective, I do find it interesting the explanations, and I'm very much in the behavioural camp for what it's worth. But um, that that's probably the most interesting part of the paper for people listening. So if you are interested in that stuff, go and go and read the paper. Um, but there's a, there's a very interesting graph in the paper um, which shows the uh, momentum for different periods and asset cl- and um, asset classes and geographic regions, and does so kind of over time. So in other words, this is well, if I look, we look at the original paper, which was like a lot of academic papers, purely focused on U.S. equities, because you know U.S. academics seem to believe that that there's only one stock market in the whole world and that's the S&P 500 um, but they found that the, um, the, the, the you got a very good statistically significant effect and you also got a, an average uh, monthly return on this factor of 1% which doesn't sound that much but then that's that's effectively another 12% a year over what you were earning and that's you know neutral of any market effect so it's it's 12% of pure alpha effectively um, which is very good obviously um, now, what's kind of happened since then is that um, a more recent paper was done by Ken French, um, who obviously is the, the, the French and Farmer French, um, and that came out this year, actually. Uh, not a paper I've read, but if looking at the survey findings, they found that the momentum has actually reduced in the US equity market. Um, and the it's reduced, but it's about half what it was effectively. So it's no longer as, as strong there. Um, but a lot, a lot of papers have also looked at thing like, things like commodity futures, which obviously is very relevant to us, uh, found very strong momentum there um, and found strong momentum in, in European equities and Japanese equities and so on and so forth. So um, you could argue that this is a 
sort of pretty standard story that in a very efficient market like the US equity market, an effect has been found and is starting to dissipate as more and more people trade it. That could be the case. Um, and But in less liquid markets, the effect is still there. So that could be one explanation. Um, you know, for me personally, and you know, th- the problem is if you if you believe that story, then eventually all momentum will disappear and it will no longer work, at least on this cross-sectional basis. Maybe as absolute momentum trend following guys will still be okay. Um, I'm not sure I'd buy that, I think, but but I think for me this is kind of a sort of hammers in the message which we hammer in a lot on this podcast, and which I personally believe is, you know, one of the most important things you should worry about, which is diversification, right? If you are just trading US equities for your momentum strategy. It won't have done as well recently as it did 30 years ago. To me, the answer to that is not to stop trading momentum, but to be trading lots and lots of different asset classes and geographic regions and getting that diversification benefit. And I also think actually what you were mentioned earlier that, um, and I agree with that behavioral biases or behavior is really important uh, in, in, in understanding why this probably works so well over so many different decades um it hasn't been arbitraged away so to speak i'm talking about trend following in this case of course so so interesting well thanks for uh, a quick update on that paper which is called momentum factor investing 30 years out of sample data as far as i recall um all right um do we any quick few words about um the topic that's coming up in the um so the, when i talk about the year end group uh, co- conversation uh, it has been recorded um, and it's being published on the 24th uh, of December and the 31st of December. So that gives us a little bit of a break in our recording schedule. Um, but it um, yeah, was a fun conversation. Um, but is there anything you want to um, tease uh, from that? Uh, or have we already talked about it? Because some of it was regarding tail hedging, which we kind of ended up talking about earlier with the question we had. We had. Yeah, so um, it was obviously fun recording the year-end episode, always is. Um, one thing that came up, and actually we we talked about it a bit earlier because we talked about tail hedging earlier, and um, I said there were two papers that we were going to talk about um, which relate to the where you put tail hedging and trend following in a portfolio. Um, and one of those um, was a, a, a paper by a, a tail hedging manager, and, you know, that they're a bit biased and... Um, you know that that paper had a number of um shall we say shortcomings <laughs> um so i obviously just dis- i disagree with the conclusion but i'd, I'd like to think that then uh, that wasn't the only reason why i didn't like the paper um now you'll have to listen to the year round episode for a, a full critique um of, of the paper but there is one thing in there i would like to just pick up on because we didn't really go into detail in the year round episode about it and it has something i've talked about before which is the relationship between leverage and um CAGR, okay, or annu- annualized return or geometric return, which are all basically the same thing. Um, now, basically, what what will happen is um, if you apply leverage to a portfolio um, or to a trading strategy or whatever, um, your kind of classic annualized mean return will increase linearly. So, if you double your leverage, you'll see it. Your um, mean return will also double, as will your standard deviation. That will mean that, for example, your sharp ratio will remain constant. That the definition of sharp ratio is basically, you know, what's the return invariant to risk, and that allows you to, to compare things that are different. Because if you assume you can use leverage, then um, you know you, you can. If you, you've got infinite leverage, you can basically just choose the strategy with the highest sharp ratio. That that's kind of done the portfolio maths. Now, CAGR works a bit differently um, because what will happen is you apply leverage. Um, if you say double the leverage on a, a portfolio with a given CAGR, with a given geometric return, um, the geometric return will not double. It will increase by less than that. Okay. If you apply leverage again and again and again, the CAGR will gradually level off and eventually you reach um, the maximum CAGR, which is also the so-called Kelly criteria. Um, but the important thing is here is that there is a relationship between leverage and geometric ratio, which there isn't between leverage and chart ratio. And that means if you're using a geometric ratio, um, sorry, a geometric return as your measure of how well or badly a portfolio is doing, or whether you should make a decision like in this paper as to whether to include, say, a trend following index or a tail hedging strategy into your portfolio, 
you need to be really wary of what will happen if you include something that has a low volatility into that mix because that low volatility will dampen down the the arithmetic return but it will also dampen down the geometric return at least most of the time unless your, your leverage overall is very high um so that that was the 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 error that was made in that paper i think so they they brought in a they said well let we're going to add a trend following strategy in but rather than picking a particular fund they chose this the sgcta cta index and indices generally have a lower volatility than they're any one of their components so this the sg cta index has a much lower standard deviation of returns a much lower risk than a typical cta hedge fund will have or cta fund a typical cta etf however you're getting your your trend following exposure um, and that means that including this very low volatility asset into you into the the mix would automatically dampen down the the geometric return and make the thing look bad. So I just thought I'd throw that in because the relationship between geometric return and leverage is something I've talked about before. Um, and uh, yeah, it is briefly in the year end podcast, but people might not understand the the technical details. We don't really go into them. So that's there as a bit of a teaser. And perhaps you can listen to the year end podcast and then come back and listen to my explanation if uh, if that will make sense. Absolutely. Appreciate that very much, uh, Rob. And by the way, if you haven't left a rating and review so far, we would love if you would take five minutes of your time to do it right after listening to this episode. It would help more people find the podcast and we would appreciate that very much. On that note, we're going to wrap up this conversation. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Jim for another fun, insightful conversation. It is, of course, OPEX uh, next week. So make sure you send in your questions. As always, you can email them to info at toptradersandplug.com and we will do our best to make sure we address them. From Rob and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.